Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Java, Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. Get ready, the show's about to begin. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast, everybody. This is episode 127, if you're keeping track from the beginning, or it's season three, episode 23. And as always, I am the incredible Jeff. And uh, if you're listening or watching this episode, I'd love it if you took a second and followed the show on social media. It's really easy to do. It is at Fueled by Deathcast across all social media platforms. And if you are listening to this podcast on your favorite listening platform, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Music, iHeartRadio, if you could take a second and subscribe to the show and leave a review, a rating, whatever it is, all that kind of stuff always helps because uh, we're always looking to get in front of new listeners and new viewers and new fans. And uh, if you are a fan, please, please, please tell your family and friends about this show and uh, leave us a nice review on whatever platform it may be. And uh, this show would be absolutely nothing without the voice of death himself, Brock Powell. Mr. Brock Powell, if you're nasty. No, that's not true. But uh, BrockVox.com, if you want to follow his journey in voice acting. He's also at BrockVox across all social media platforms. Um, He is having an incredible career as a voice actor. He's always getting new things to do, and he's always putting himself out there. He works so hard in the industry, and it's inspiring to follow his journey. And uh, we love him here because, you know, like I said, this show would be nothing without him on this show every single week. Secret code unlocked. Discount of death. Speaking of the voice of death, you heard him right there. For being a listener or a viewer of this show, you get a discount code. And 12% off can be get, got anytime that you make a purchase on deathwishcoffee.com. And right at checkout, you can type in the code discount of death, all one word, or you want to make me happy, you should do it as Discount of Jeff because it's my name and it's one less letter and it's super easy to remember. Discount of Jeff will get you 12% off on deathwishcoffee.com. And speaking of deathwishcoffee.com, not only do we have our, all of our amazing coffee and merchandise on there, but you can find all of the episodes of the podcast right on deathwishcoffee.com, all of our incredible blogs in our blog space, and you can stay up to date with all of it by signing up for our newsletter. And it's super easy to do. Go to deathwishcoffee.com, scroll right to the bottom of the, of the page, and, it'll, and it literally says just enter your email address. And every week you'll get... Um, news about new deals, new products, new blogs and podcasts that are coming out, and some of our incredible content and new stores that we're going to be in. It's just the best way to keep up to date with everything from Death Wish Coffee. So sign up for our newsletter today. I want to take a second to shout out some of our friends of the show who have shows of their own. First and foremost is Mr. Ricky Rackman. You might remember Ricky as the host of MTV's Headbangers Ball, Um, but he also was the co-conspirator behind one of the most infamous rock clubs ever created, cat house and uh all of the stories of what went down within those walls stayed within those walls until now and ricky has his brand new podcast the cat house hollywood podcast where he every other week he regales us with stories from inside the walls of that club and some of the biggest names in rock and roll and hollywood graced through the front door and The stories are legendary, legendary stuff. It is one of my favorite new podcasts, and you can find it wherever podcasts are found, including right on iTunes. Also friend of the show is Zetro, Steve Souza of the band 
Exodus. He um, has a web series now that you can find on YouTube. Go on YouTube, type in Zetro's Toxic Vault, and hit the, that subscribe button so you can get new episodes all the time. Stories from the road, stories of early days of metal, stories of just Zetro being Zetro. It is so interesting and entertaining to watch all the new episodes as they come out. And uh, you can find all of Zetro's Toxic Vault right on YouTube. Speaking of metal, this week we have a very special guest, bassist Terry Butler from countless metal bands, but currently playing with Obituary. Um, And I recorded this interview with Terry a few months back when they came to town with uh, Hatebreed on Hatebreed's 25th anniversary tour. And I sat with Terry on Obituary's tour bus, and we talked about death metal, and we talked about the love of music and everything in between. And uh, since then, Terry recently has suffered an incredible tragedy. His daughter, um, Jonah, was killed in a car accident. And all of our love and support goes out to Terry and Obituary and everybody fr- that are friends and family with, with, with Terry and his family. And um, there's an incredible GoFundMe that has been set up. You can go to this URL, GoFundMe.com slash Jonah Wright, um, because uh, not only did Terry lose her, his daughter, but uh, she had two boys and they lost their mother. And you can donate today to help out her two boys and the family in their time of need. And it, uh, and it's just a sad, sad tragedy. And again, our, our love and support go out to the entire obituary family. Um, but it was incredible a couple months back to sit down with Terry and just hear how inspiring it is for someone who's been in the business for so long, but still has such an inherent love of music and of performing live and of being there for his fans and uh, being touring the world with bands like Obituary. So mugs up this week for this week's death guest, Terry Butler of Obituary. The Fueled by Death Guest. Terry, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me today. Um, and I kind of want to start. Pleasure. I want to start where we are. We're on. We're on your tour bus. You're um, right now on tour, uh, supporting Hatebreed on their 25th anniversary tour, which makes us all feel old. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, when this uh, episode with you actually comes out, um, the tour will probably be just wrapping up. But we're at the we're at the start of it. What's it like? How's it been? The first couple days. Uh, it's it's great. This is the second show. Last night in Worcester was amazing. Uh, great energy from the crowd. Um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, killer turnout. Yeah. Uh, all the bands are getting along. So I mean, that's always a positive. <laughs> Touring in 2019, especially on a giant metal death metal tour, um, is it is it completely different than back in the day? Like like what's 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 the biggest difference you'd say? I think the biggest difference is actually the technology. I mean, when I was my first tour in early eighty seven, you know, you had no cell phones, no computers, none of this stuff, you know. So I mean a lot of it was word of mouth, putting flyers around town, local fanzines, um, that kind of stuff. I mean the crowds are pretty similar. You know the crowds are always there yeah but as far as the actual it's much easier to tour now you know yeah back then we we're renting you you know uh, rvs and right. doing everything yourself driving all night blah blah but uh i mean that's the biggest difference i mean you know the people that were 20 and 87 they're now my age and whatever mm-hmm. but they're still there now their kids are coming too yeah <laughs> Which, which is really cool. Yeah, I mean, so the scene is still there. Yeah. But um, as far as, it's just the technolo- technology is different, you know. Right. Which is a bonus for us. I think that I think that helps out yeah. a lot, you know, especially with, as technical as metal bands get, you know. I mean, yeah. like, you know, I remember back in the day going to shows in, like, the early 90s, and mm-hmm. if the sound wasn't dialed in perfect, you're just getting <laughs> farts on the on the yeah. speakers, you know? Uh, I mean, uh, like, and now with the tech, it's, it's you can really hear everything, yeah. experience everything. Yeah. I think it's such a better experience. Absolutely. You know, the sound engineers can dial it in better now, your sound man. Yeah. You know, and also, going back just for a second, social media has made things... 
I mean, you blast out, hey, we're playing here tomorrow, and it goes on five different social sites. I mean, right. That's one way to get it out, which is amazing. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So let's go all the way back then. I mean, you started playing in the late 80s, um, and what I, I always love asking this question of musicians, what made you pick up the bass? What was, where did that begin for you? Um, it was most likely just kind of out of convenience, you know, the band needed a bass player kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> because, I mean, I used to always want to be ace freely. You know, I was jumping on my bed with a tennis racket yeah. and, you know, love gun and stuff. Yeah. That's, you know, guitar is sexy. That's what you want to play, you know. Drums and bass, you kind of, you know, it's almost like the goalie in hockey or, you know, the last guy picked on the team kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, I love it, you know. I mean, I just kind of graduated to that when I first started playing and, and you know I, I actually really enjoy playing bass yeah so so you start you got you cut your teeth you start playing um, your was your first band death no it was actually uh, massacre massacre was first my best friend kind of started the band yep. uh, Bill Andrews and uh, at some point the bass player they had at the time was released let go and I was there at every practice from day one, you know, so I knew all the songs yeah. already. So he just called me up and said, hey, bring your bass over here. We got a spot for you. So I, I went over and, you know, we uh, played in Massacre for about nine months. And then, um, I mean, it's real deep, convoluted history. But we, uh, the, the guitar player, myself and the drummer went over to Death. Mm -hmm. They had just recorded their first album. And uh, he didn't. Chuck didn't have a lineup because he moved back to Orlando from California. So we kind of joined forces, Massacre and Chuck, you know. And we toured for Scream Buddy Gore, and, and you know we did all yeah. the, the next couple albums, and then uh, went back to Massacre for a couple years. <laughs> did Six Feet for a while, yeah, and then uh, now into Obituary. You know, yeah, so. back in those days with Massacre and Death, like. Was it harder to get, uh, not necessarily get the word out, because we did talk about yeah. social media, but was it harder to to get the fan base growing? Because it was, so, I mean, metal itself was such a new thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, we were, and death metal itself, coming yeah. from like uh, the death era, you know. Well, um, a lot of, what helped a lot of that was tape trading back in the day. Right. You, I mean, a demo back then was really important, you know, because labels just weren't signing people left and right. So you put a demo out, and everyone in the underground traded that demo, you know. So that's how the word got out, you know. And that's what Massacre did, put two demos out in in '86, uh, yep. and um, became a cult following. It was, a, you know, those demos are classic, you know. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, from there, you know, it made it a lot easier to get signed later on. You know, we tried. You know, Massacre didn't get signed initially early on. Because we did the death thing for a while, but then when we went, went back to Massacre, Eric Records signed us immediately, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you, you mentioned, you know, in between and uh, on parallel to all that, you also started playing for Six Feet Under, and you played for Six Feet yeah. Under for I think over a decade, right? Sixteen years. Sixteen years. Yeah. My gosh. And that was, you know, from the early '90s into you know almost the modern era of metal, yeah. and. Six Feet Under was one of those first bands that really started to be part of the conversation. Metal was always the underground, was always the, you know, like yeah. the, the yo, they're the guys in the dark, you know, corner. But with Six Feet Under, it really was the, these types of bands like Hatebreed and that kind of thing where it was starting to be part of the popular conversation. Yeah. What was that like? Well, even today, metal death metal and all of its offshoots are, it's still a bastard child of music right you know what i mean it's it's looked at as like you know let's just not talk about that right. it's it's horrible it's terrible <laughs> that's how mainstream looks at it but um yeah six feet early on you know um we, we kind of you know i came from death you had you know chris from cannibal alan west from obituary or whatever People kind of thought, oh, it's going to be, you know, fast like Cannibal with some killer technical death riff. No, right. we on purpose sat out to let's just make this dark, heavy, groovy, simplified where you can kind of digest all of it and you understand what it is and everything. Yeah. And that was the focus early on. And I think we come, we, we, you know, were able to accomplish that. But kind of later years that I was in Six Feet, that kind of got watered down and we, we tried to go in different areas and this and that and whatever mm. but but uh yeah 
Yeah. yeah. And now with obituary, um, you know, obituary started back again, same time, like with death and massacre yeah. and all that stuff. So it, godfathers of, of, of this genre and are still going strong. You guys just last year did, you know, a bunch of dates with Slayer. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that? What, uh, what was, was that like? Uh, incredible. I mean, yeah. not only you're playing with Slayer, you get to see him every night. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Like, <laughs> And it was incredible. It's a bucket list thing, obviously. And it was great for after being a band for you know, basically since 85. Yeah. To get thrown a bone like that and to be able to do that was amazing. And, and their crew and the band themselves and all the bands on that tour were awesome. We, you know, it was such a great feeling. Yeah. And it was killer, you know. And, it, you know, to be around still doing this, it, it, it's a testament to the core of the band, which is John, Donald, Trevor. Right. They've been there from day one consistently. All yeah. And, um, you know, the addition of Ken Andrews, the guitar player, you know, the lead player, it's yeah. just absolutely amazing. You know, he... He's such a killer guitar player. He never overplays. He knows exactly what in the pocket to do and everything. And it's 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 great. You know? That's awesome. You know? Speaking of in the pocket, I mean, throughout your career, you are an uncanny bassist, and I want to say that to you Thank as a you. fan. Like the way that you lock into a rhythm section, and yeah. it it you can hear your progression throughout the different bands that you've been yeah. in. Do you feel? With each project that you've been a part of, it's changed your playing, it's added to your playing, or do you feel like you've yeah. just stayed the course? No, it definitely has, you know, like when I got into Six Feet, I started using a pick because there was one guitar player and it was just a chunkier, more riff orientated kind of thing, you know, and I just felt a pick, playing with a pick is going to be a lot, you know, more precise. Mm hmm lot something more solid and and you know in death it was i used my fingers and the rhythms were a little more technical and um so yeah each band is kind of a little different uh obituary is kind of it breathes a lot the song so there's like a lot of space you can do some stuff like i've never i mean my favorite bass players are like geezer butler yeah steve harris getty lee yeah uh, phil and not john paul jones but i'm not a flashy guy because the music I play, I don't think needs for me to be doing bass runs all over it and stuff. You know what I mean? Right. So I like, and, and to me, it's really important to be like I lock in with Donald and we're and with Ken when we're playing rhythms or Trevor. You know, it's just it's so solid. It's like a wall of death. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, that's just you know the style I like to play. That's awesome. So speaking on side on almost on top of that from style, but to tech. Um, what's your favorite type of bass to play? Um, it's usually just a, a kind of a modern shape because sometimes you get the crazy shapes. Yeah, it's top heavy. You're yep. holding the bass a lot more with your fingering hand. Mm -hmm. It takes away from what you can do. So something kind of mostly with a strap body. Like my favorite bass of all time that I have that I still have. It's a Charvel that I got from <laughs> like '87. Really? Yeah. And uh, that's what I. Re that's what leprosy was recorded with and, and you know i use it on a bunch of stuff um it's my favorite bass because it sounds great it's solid and you know that's awesome uh, that's all, okay so the other side of that then white whale if you had all the money in the world what would be the bass that you would <laughs> oh well i'd love to have a rickenbacker uh, totally, i know totally right specked out, uh, teched out. Uh, yeah that'd be great to have one of those you oh know or God. even like um um john Entwistle, who's another big influence of mine I'd love to have one of his bases, you know, mm -hmm. it would be killer, but obviously it's a dream. But That's awesome. <laughs> so, so back to obituary, we've got, um, you know, you guys have been touring, it seems nonstop since uh, obituary's self-titled record in 2017 came out. Yeah. And um, on tour, when you guys go out with such a wealth of material now, mm -hmm. do you, do you tailor it towards the the show that you're playing? Do you tailor it more towards new material, new, more towards old material? Like how do how does those set lists kind of come to be? Um, yeah, it can get hard because you know a lot of times it's like okay, you got 45 minutes or, to play, or you have an hour and 15, so right. you got to kind of okay, we got 17 songs we can play. Let's pull from 120 songs. <laughs> yeah, but when your new album comes out, you kind of play. You want to have a lot of new songs in the set maybe four or five new songs wrapped with some classics and stuff but it, it depends you know um 
maybe if we're playing um, a, a country we know likes this certain album a lot more, we might put a couple songs in it from that. Right. But it, it basically is just kind of a feel thing, you know. It's like, hey, we haven't played this song in like ten years. Let's play that one, you know. And you kind of bring a few old ones back in every now and then. That's that must make it refreshing too. To yeah, like be it definitely on stage. does. I mean, you know, there's there's a like slowly we rot. I think the band has played that song every show ever because it's like one of the most popular songs so yeah and it's a classic closing song so it's like okay we got to play this song right (laughs) and that's good yeah people are expecting it yeah so it it can get difficult to try and come up with a set list you know you mentioned you know depending on you know where you're going to play and in countries and stuff like that um and I, I I've talked to other musicians and I I seem to get a consensus about this what is it like playing Europe or other countries that than America are the crowds bigger? Are they more invested? Um, I mean, it seems like Europe. They kind of live and breathe the music, you know. Yeah. Like in the states, it's like, I mean, you got your core diehard fans, but a lot of people in the states are kind of on the fringe. They're so influenced by what's on the radio or what the media says or yeah. whatever crap's coming across Facebook or whatever. But in Europe, they're like. They know what they like, and, and, and that's what they want to hear. And, um, you know, you could have a kid that might have a Hellhammer shirt, but he's got a vest on. The back patch on the back might be Halloween. You right. Know, it's, they're just, you know, there seems like they're a little more open-minded about all the types of music. I mean, it's good in the States, you know, too, mm-hmm. but, it, like, the States is a little more... It's a little more commercial with with like yeah. oh you guys on the radio well then you must not be good that right kind of thing you know which is a shame yeah definitely where uh, where outside of the states is one of your favorite places to play well um, you know Europe and more specifically like Germany's always amazing to play yeah England is a great place for us um, uh, Spain you know. Um, Poland. I mean, it's it's you know yeah everywhere. South America is huge too. Oh I mean, they, yeah, they're fanatical there. They they're so passionate about the music, almost to a point of being like I said, fanatics. <laughs> yeah, I think it, that's what's lost on American audiences because I've talked to other musicians and they have the same similar yeah. sentiment that, um, you know, other countries treat live music as an event, as the thing that yeah. is part of you, the thing that you need to experience, whereas it, I feel like we've lost that here. Yeah. Uh, you know, here, they, it just seems like there's so much distractions for people as far as, you know, people have phones shoved in their face constantly and this and that. But, yeah, in Europe, I mean, you, you, you have cities in that, like, actually... It's a city-sponsored venue. Mm-hmm. It's built by the city that bands can come and play in. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and it's just, I don't know, that's the feeling I get. It's like um, the, both places are great for music, but Europe just seems to be a little more open-minded and accepts the extreme music a little more. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, now let's talk a little bit about extreme music. Like, when death metal started, it was we didn't even have a term for it, you know, like, oh, and, yeah. and um, since, you know, it has become this thing that unless you're invested in it, yeah. on the outliers, think of it as just this violent type of music. Whereas, you know, if you do know about death metal and a lot of fans talk about mm-hmm. this, it's actually cathartic. It's actually something of that a, a release. Do you, you agree with this? Absolutely. I mean, music in general, you know, it's like, it's a, it was an evolution, you know, you had, Judas Priest and Deep Purple and and, and um, Motorhead and then then it started getting a little heavier. You had Venom and then Bathory and then Hellhammer and Sons of Cross, Dark Angel, blah blah. It just you know it grows on itself and gets heavier and heavier. But um, it's it's a release. You know, obviously there's going to be people that um, you know get a little too much into it and they want to actually live the lyrics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, you know. I want to ha- live my life like a deicide song. Well, then you're going to get in trouble and do some stupid shit. <laughs> yeah, you know? definitely. But, um, but for the most part, it's in your soul. It's in your blood. You know, it's like part of me, and and um, you know, it's a great place. You know, I love going to shows because all my friends are there, and it's a good meeting point. And yeah, it's like a you know, it, it's a underground kind of thing where you know, yeah, gathering and it's great. Totally. Do you do you find yourself listening to a lot of death metal? I do, but not so much new stuff. I mean, you know, I'm an 
old dude, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's set in your ways. I'm stuck in my ways. <laughs> I like the traditional kind of death metal early on. The yeah. Past, you know, like I said, like autopsy and the death stuff and possessed. Yeah. You know, the early stuff. That's all my favorite stuff, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, what we get to on this show is the the, the ethos is is that we're all fueled by death. Yeah. We all want to leave this world a little different before we inevitably leave it for good. Well, sure, yeah. And um, you know, your you personally, your legacy, I think, is 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 locked because of what you've been able to provide to the music community, and also you know just the 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 wealth of yeah. amazing records you've been on. Um, but through it all, through your career, what fuels you, what drives you to keep going, to keep getting up on stage, performing, writing music? What, what fuels you to do that? It's just the love of music. I mean, I love playing. I love the whole production of pulling up to a show. You get out, you unload your equipment, you set it up, you do a sound check, um, you set your merch up knowing that what you're doing, people want to see and hear. Mm -hmm. They're coming to see you. They're coming to have a release come and enjoy your music seeing people in the front row you know a head bang or see a pit going on someone singing the lyrics it's just you're providing them with something and it's a great way to get off on that it's a release of that and i love playing live music i love seeing people enjoy the music that i play and create that's the main driving force you know yeah there's still a fire there there's to be creative and still write new music you know so there's no retirement Oh, no. I mean, not until my body gives out or the culture or society says, okay, no one wants to hear music anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll you never happen. I mean? No, that's, not at all. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, the, other, the other question, I guess, on obituary side, um, are you guys working on a new record? Are you thinking about a new record? We're definitely thinking about it. The wheels are turning. They're not, like, spinning at 100 miles an hour at the moment, but mm -hmm. they are turning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have some ideas, and you know we, we, we have a, a time frame we want to have it out. Probably you know next year is probably the most realistic time frame. Excellent. I can't really give it a specific right. week or month, but uh, yeah, there's definitely ideas kicking around, and uh, we will have something out most likely next year. That's excellent. With with your tour schedule with the band, what is the writing process like? Most of the time, it's just uh, you might we might be at sound check. I mean, a practice or even sound check someone comes up with a riff and they're like hey that's really cool record that let's do that you know or sometimes it's just like okay we're gonna write an album this month let's get in the studio and just start churning out some riffs and some up and stick some of them don't yeah so you kind of you know noodle around put a drum beat to it you know and, and john's always there listening to it and getting ideas so he kind of puts his lyrics on it you know we never really know what's going on until he actually does them which is kind of cool because you it's a mystery you know yeah so yeah. Like so he actually writes the lyrics into the songs as the as the writing process is happening. Sometimes yeah, like you, you know we'll be jamming on a new song and there's you know he'll just kind of get some ideas you know, like he probably right now has ideas of song titles and stuff in his head, just waiting to hear the perfect song to put them on you know, like very rarely does someone come to practice. Okay, here's the song I wrote. Here's from front to back. Here's a drum beat that's gonna go to it. Right. Blah blah blah. You know, it's right. kind of an organic thing where it's like okay. Here's a couple riffs. How do we want to put them together? How long do we, what measures? How long do we want it to have? Where's the chorus going to be? That kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's really exciting because it's it, it seems like such an undertaking to tour as much as you do and then also constantly be thinking about new records and and recording. Um, do you gravitate towards one or the other? Do you do you like performing more than recording or recording more than 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 performing? I love the live situation better recording yeah. recording is cool because you're making new music but it can be very tedious yeah because when it's your turn to record you're kind of under a microscope it's just you you know right everyone's looking at you and um but you know uh i'm always i love the live element the yeah best, but it's cool to put a new record out and hear it and that's my you know that's our music and right. whatever but yeah that's cool what do you think about the state of music today specifically metal but I, we can even go farther in, into music but what do you think of the state of music do you think we're in a good place do you think there, there needs to be change well I mean if we're talking all music in general I think it's just 
obviously the media they get stuck on one thing right you know it just seems like you know hey here's a singer she can't sing worth a crap but mm-hmm. she looks good let's write some fake music and have her fake vocals on it right and, but that's it's always been that way even back in the 50s teeny bopper if you yep. look good but whatever but it just seems like they focus so much on that that um even like at the grammys or any kind of awards it's like swept under the rug you know and it's just like there's so much good music out there that's that's you know hard rock and heavy metal or whatever that just gets no play at all yeah again it goes back to oh you have tattoos you have long hair you have piercings oh that's horrible you know yeah but you know we're always fighting for that recognition but i think music you know that's just my kind of personal beef about it yeah all the good music never really gets play it's all the the shallow fluffy stuff yeah you know that the 15 year old girls or 12 year old girls want to hear you know there's no i feel like there's no there's no clubhouse for metal anymore yeah. you know i mean i grew up in the era of mtv yeah. you know we had metal videos on 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 yeah. on the television and then headbangers ball you know mm-hmm. like i would stay up late to watch headbangers yeah. ball so i could see bands like yeah. obituary and stuff you know like on on television we don't have that anymore no you don't and I mean, it's a shame you know a band makes a video what outlet is there to put it on except your own website your Facebook or YouTube. I mean, right. It's not going to be on TV. Yeah. It's, it's so funny because like Headbangers Ball, even back in the day, it's like they're playing Aerosmith and Poison. And right. Like, Come on. It's called Headbangers Ball. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whatever. But it's always going to be the way. Corporate always gets involved with things and it's just, you know, it's like if you know a lot about a certain industry and then the commercial side of the industry gets a lot of play you're like that's not really how it is right how it really is is down here but that's how it's always going to be yeah what do you think is the future of death metal do you think death metal is going to continue on the same path do you think it, there's there's hope for for more do you do like well, there's, there's always going to be more i mean what's extreme back when i was 17 right nowadays kids look at it like that's terrible that's horrible that's not even extreme. <laughs> but you know i don't know what it's going to be 20 years from now i mean how faster can you get right it's more technical can you get? <laughs> right so then you think okay maybe it's going to fall back onto just what sounds really good from the old days and what's still relevant now but i think there's going to always be extreme form of music and i don't know what's going to sound like 10 15 20 years from now but um you know I'm sure there's going to be an audience for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm ex- I'm always excited yeah. to see, you know, the, especially the metal genre yeah. morph and change. And yeah, it's 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 morphed so much now, you know. I don't even know what's next. Ska death metal or <laughs> polka death, death, oh, no. death metal, country death metal. I'll, mean, give, it what, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. You never metal. know. Space know metal. <laughs> oh, obituary in space. I, I love it. I'd lo- well, yeah. I'd love to play a show on the space station. I'd you know, love it. Mars. Yeah, that'd be, I mean, but maybe we can, maybe hopefully. we can. That, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so through 2019, you guys are going to be finishing up um, with Hatebreed's 25th anniversary tour. Um, do you guys have plans for tour after that or? Yeah, uh, we're going to tour the States. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not, you know, we can't release the dates yet. Right. Uh, it's going to be kind of from somewhere around September-ish, I guess, you know. Then we're going to go to Europe and do a tour as well. Oh, awesome. And in between that, we're trying to fit in going to some other parts of the world. But that'll all be coming out soon. Never stop. Well, that's the way it is now, you know. You yeah. Gotta, you know, unfortunately, it is a business, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the day, when I first started touring, you know, um, you could rely a little bit on the record sales. Mm-hmm. You know, you made me not tour as much. But now, it's, it's become to where... The merch is the big deal. Right. You, know, you can do so much with merch now, and uh, and also you get a tour a little bit more because that's where the money is. Yeah. But you know, I love touring, so it doesn't really affect me a whole lot. But, that's good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. It's good that you still get to do what you love. Absolutely. And that's inspiring. Um, finally, for our viewers and listeners, um, we did talk about social media. Obviously, Obituary Band is is everywhere on all social media, and it's yeah. and it's easy to follow. Do you personally? do social media that people oh, yeah. can follow your journey definitely um you know facebook i'm on there mm-hmm. um i'm on instagram um it's terry butler 67 and the same for twitter okay 
Yeah. It's Excellent. I'll put all that in the show. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, I usually I'll, I'll pimp out every band I've been in, basically, and all the obituary stuff, and also my own personal stuff too. But, Excellent. Yeah, it gets a little monotonous because. <laughs> You know, you go, hey, we got to post about the show, then you got to post it to your sites and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. Hey, that's what you got to do. That's so, what you got to do. Yeah. That's awesome, though. And I, like I said, I'll have all that in the show. Right. Terry, I can't thank you enough for taking time with talking to me well, today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Awesome. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.